Hi, I'm Eric Loris Phillips. Thank you for joining me for this latest update on Frederick County Public Schools operations during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm joined today by FCPS Interim Superintendent, Dr. Mike Marco, and Board of Education of Frederick County President, Brad Young. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for having us. Today we'll be discussing where we go from here. Since March 2020, we have been responding to a global health crisis. So far, in the 2021-22 school year, we have offered in-person learning for 44,000 students and remote learning for 1,000 students through the blended virtual schools. Unfortunately, in recent weeks, we have seen a significant surge in positive COVID-19 cases in Maryland. This understandably has caused concern in our FCPS community. Our discussion today will focus on the steps we are taking during this stage of the pandemic and why. Mike, will you share why Frederick County Public Schools is committed to staying open for in-person instruction at this stage of the pandemic? Well, we certainly follow the guidance and direction of our experts in the research, and it really points that in-person instruction is in the best interest of our students. We know that they're gonna be more engaged, they're gonna be participating. We know that they're gonna have access to the teacher in the classroom, and not to mention they have materials, resources, and additional supports within the in-person setting. The other piece that we, we just can't hide from is the social emotional welfare of our students. And we know that they're social beings, that they need to be in school, they need to be interacting with adults and, and with peers. Brad, you've had the opportunity to speak to so many parents, teachers, staff members, and community members over the past two years. And you've shared much of those conversations with us at board meetings. Uh, can you talk about the importance of keeping school buildings open and why you feel that way? First, I do want to acknowledge that we are in a uh, time where a lot of people are afraid. We've, we've gone through a period of two years where we've had information that's changed many times. We've not been sure of exactly what we should or shouldn't do. Uh, but now that we've seen that we can bring kids into school, be able to conduct the educational day in a setting that's as safe as we can make it for our staff and our students, the, the public has said, we want our students in school. Uh, I, I've been out through the community and I can't tell you, I cannot go anywhere without somebody coming up and saying, thank you for having our kids in school because that's where they need to be. Just yesterday, I stopped at my grandson's bus stop uh, and all the parents were there anxiously awaiting for their kids to get off from elementary school. And as they came off, you could just feel the energy and the excitement that they were in school. And so as Dr. Marco said, the social emotional piece of students being in school is so important. It's also important for the parents. The parents sometimes need that uh, opportunity for their student to be somewhere else and have some other interactions with students and adults. And so I think our community understands how important it is, but yet we understand the fears that folks have of uh, the fact that the Omicron variants out there and many more people are testing positive. So we have to do everything we can to keep our kids in school while keeping them and our staff safe because that is what is best for our students. And so let me ask this question, either one of you can take this. You, you talked about the fears and the concerns that some, of our, some in our community have because of the Omicron variant of COVID-19. How do we address and take care of those concerns and those needs? Well, I would say we have to continue to have our mitigation strategies in place uh, face coverings, social distancing when we can, uh, doing everything possible to keep our employees safe and our students safe. We need to continue to do that. We need to be very cognizant of the importance of having face coverings on at all times, except when they're naturally in the lunchroom. And we need to be reinforcing that. Uh, but we need to continue just to monitor the data as well and keep track of the different components that would in fact have us close a school. Thank you. And I'd like to add to that, in addition to wearing the face mask, that parents need to be responsible and recognize when their students have symptoms that may be uh, ones that would lead to that, that they keep them home. The only way we're gonna get through this is if we all responsibly do the right things, which is continuing to stay distant, to wearing the mask, to not being out in public when we have symptoms. And so asking parents to say, all right, it's okay if you're student stays home for a day or two 
while they have symptoms to make sure that they don't have it and they aren't spreading it. So we all have to take a piece of the responsibility. Yes, a community effort for sure. Yes, absolutely. The Maryland State Department of Education has shared their desire for schools to remain open for students as well. There have been so many benefits to having students back in classrooms in recent months. Mike, what benefits have you seen during your visits to schools and conversations with students and staff and members of the community in the, over the past couple of weeks? Well, I've had the opportunity to get into many schools and interact with both our teachers and our food and nutrition service employees, our custodians, our bus drivers. And for the student's point of view, I can't see them smiling because they have their face covering on naturally, but I see energy and excitement in our students. I've been in this business almost 30 years and typically when I ask a student, do you like school? It's a shrug and a, when I ask students during this moment in time, do you like school, I get a big nod and a big reinforcing fist pump that they're so excited to be in school. Now, conversely, our employees are stretched and stressed in being that they're being asked to do many things that they didn't have to do pre-pandemic. We have limited resources, we have some vacancies and people have had to step up. And I think it's so important that as a community, we acknowledge and respect and revere the efforts of our staff over this trying time. One of the, the greatest stories I heard uh, right before the break is a teacher going in and pulling out two cafeteria workers because they were managing so much and the student body gave them a standing ovation. Mm -hmm. So we need to keenly be aware of the stress and strain and the efforts of our our employees and respond with respect and reverence. Really appreciate you bringing that forth. I'm just thinking about an email that was received by a colleague this week saying, everyone is stressed. It's really important just to take a moment to send an email saying thank you. So our colleagues are really doing a great deal to support one another and to have that reverence and support from the community is greatly appreciated. And patience, yeah. and patience from our community, recognizing that everything is perfect. Uh, that comes with the pandemic, but we're working through it. Even so, as we address this stage of the pandemic, it's important to share with the community what contingency plans we have in place. So Mike, can you share with us what it would take for schools to return to virtual learning for a short period of time? Well, as we've already stated, we're very committed to staying in person, but we are monitoring the data very carefully. We're looking at student attendance, we're looking at positivity rates within the school, we're looking at resources available, uh, that would be something that may force us to do a temporary pause in in-person instruction and go to virtual. But I think it's really important to, to know that we're looking at each individual school and making a school by school decision as to whether or not we need to continue in person or to go virtual. All these factors, along with uh, collaboration with the health department, uh, we are monitoring, making decisions, what we feel is in the best interest of each individual school. Okay. So Mike, you mentioned resources that are available. So are you specifically talking about human resources, our teachers, custodial staff, food nutritional workers, our transportation staff? We're taking a very holistic approach and looking at each employee group. And uh, do we have the bus drivers? Do we have the teachers? Have we deployed all our central office resources, which we have been doing uh, to support schools? But once we get to the, to the point where we cannot safely support our school and provide a good delivery of instruction and services, then we would be forced to go to a virtual. Now it's important to note, this would be a very temporary, it would be five to seven days, so we can get a better handle on the, on the health metrics within the building and, and then move back to in-person instruction. And that really amplifies the importance of each member of the FCPS community in contributing to what happens in the school? Absolutely, yeah. Thank absolutely. You. So a follow-up question related to that is, under what scenario would hybrid learning take place? And you mentioned the five to seven days for a, a move to virtual, but would hybrid instruction take place for the same period of time? No, hybrid would be a long-term solution for Frederick County Public Schools in that we would need to be hybrid for a marking period or a semester. Otherwise we would go virtual and then re return and shift back to, to, to in-person instruction. So what would it take for us to move to that scenario where we were hybrid for a longer period of time? I think it would be the health department or the governor saying we need to re return to a previous model for an extended period of time. And then we would be ready to 
uh, certainly shift to a hybrid model in that we would have two cohorts, a cohort A and a cohort B, uh, very similar to what we did last year. Okay, thank you. So both of, both of you mentioned one of the mitigation strategies being the wearing of masks. Why are masks still being worn in schools and in our offices? And have they helped to mitigate the spread of COVID-19? Well, I think if you talk to the doctors, if you talk to uh, our health officials locally and at the state level, they're going to tell you that it is uh, the number one of the number one mitigating factors to prevent the spread of COVID. And we remain committed to doing everything possible to prevent the spread and keep our students in person learning. And part of that is face coverings, both uh, for adults and for students. We know it's a huge inconvenience, but it's something that's going to prevent further spread of COVID-19. And, and did want to clarify that that was put in place as a mandate by our State Board of Education. Uh, my understanding is that they do having, have a off-ramping uh, model whereby school systems, when they meet certain metrics, would be able to consider uh, taking face coverings, coverings off. We're nowhere uh, close to those metrics. So at such point that things start to calm down and we can start to look at whether or not that we can meet those metrics, we could consider face coverings uh, not being required, but that's not going to be anytime soon. And that's an important reminder for us. Right. Yeah. So how can the community best help us in our goal to protect the in-person learning option? I would say first of all, let Dr. Marco answer, support your school system. Uh, our, our employees from our central office to our school administrators, to our teachers, to our support staff, our bus drivers, our instructional assistants, our food service workers, our uh, administrative assistants in the office are all working extremely hard to keep your kids in school. And so do the things to help support them uh, because obviously if they're not there, we cannot provide the instruction. And so their mental health is extremely important at this time as well. I can tell you that many of them are feeling battered and bruised. They go on social media, they're being beaten up because uh, certain things are happening that are out of their control. So the first thing is support your school, support the employees. They do care. They are here to help your student learn. Uh, but then following the rules, uh, making sure that your student's wearing their face mask, making sure that again, if they have symptoms that they're staying home, doing the simple things that can help us make sure that we can keep the schools open for students. Yeah, I would, I'd piggyback that with gratitude and appreciation and respect for, for our workers that are working so very hard. I know no principal wants to make the call and say your child needs to isolate or quarantine, but it's part of the reality that we're living these days. And if parents can be understanding and appreciative and, and extend a thank you or thank you for your hard work and your dedication, that goes so far. And we know that our employees and our educators are just working so very hard to ensure the success of our in-person learning and the success of our schools. So I just have to say the gratitude, appreciation, and respect for what they're doing, that goes miles when our community can extend it to them. Yeah, you're absolutely correct, Mike. And, and we appreciate the uh, gratitude that's already been extended to our employees across the school system. We also appreciate the fact that our community uh, reaches out to us with recommendations on how to improve our processes. And I'd say, Eric, please, please, the community, please continue to give us your insights and input. They're very valuable and they help guide and direct us. Yeah, it, it just shows that none of us can do that, can get through this alone. Absolutely. And I would say the same thing from the board perspective. If you want to contact the board, you can do that at board at fcps.org. We've received many emails with suggestions and we certainly appreciate those and we wanna keep an open relationship with the community. So when you have something that you see that doesn't look right or you have the suggestions, please feel free to send them to the board as well. Thank you both so much. Appreciate your time today and sharing some additional details with us regarding our, our latest COVID-19 pandemic situation. Thank you. Please keep checking our website, fcps.org, and keep checking for our Find Out First messages. We are committed to regularly communicating with you as conditions change. Please continue to take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and be well, everyone.